Al Capone Does My Shirts by Jennifer Koldenko, Part 3, Chapter 33, The Sun and the Moon, Monday, May 27th, 1935. As the day of Nat's interview approaches, my mother behaves as if her nerves have rotted and fallen apart like old rubber bands. She can't seem to sit still, can't stop moving, can't keep her eyes off Natalie. The day before Natalie's interview is her birthday. We have countless discussions about this. Should we celebrate it? Will the celebration throw Natalie off her schedule or will skipping Natalie's birthday upset her more? What kind of food should Natalie eat this week? What should we wear? What should she wear? Should she have more or less button time? More or less time with Mrs. Kelly? More or less math time? More or less time with me? No detail is too small to be considered. And always we end right where we start. We'll keep Natalie's schedule the same this week and have a small birthday celebration just like we always do. But every night, my mother seems to have to decide this all over again. When Natalie's birthday finally arrives, my mother tries with all her considerable energy to make things appear normal. Remember, tomorrow is the interview, she tells me in a low voice. Mom, I roll my eyes. How could I possibly forget that? She sighs. You're right. I'm sorry. She pats my shoulder. Just keep her quiet today. There's extra lemon cake and, of course, her buttons. If she wants to play buttons all day long, it's perfectly fine with me. Just make sure she doesn't have one of her fits. She'll be a wreck tomorrow if she does. It takes her a week to get over one of those. I know, Mom. I know. And you have my number at the leaves? My mother wiggles her hands in her gloves. Yes, Mom. Maybe I should stay home? She tugs her glove off. I hold my breath. I want my mom to stay home in the worst way. What if something goes wrong? Would you? I ask. She shakes her head. You're better with Natalie than I am. Her voice cracks. She doesn't look at me. She dabs her eyes, her gloves back on now. I am? She nods, staring at the clasp of her purse. I'll be home early. Let's just pretend this is a normal day. Her voice is strained. She leaves without saying goodbye to Natalie or to me. Natalie is busy in her room. She's drawing pictures of the moon in all its phases. For the past few weeks, Natalie has been obsessed with the moon. This is strange for her. She's always been fascinated by the sun, but she doesn't like to do anything but watch it rise. She has never wanted to draw pictures of the sun, the moon, or anything else for that matter. For once, I get my book out without feeling bad about it. Natalie is content. I crack open David Copperfield and begin to read chapter one, I Am Born. The next thing I know, I hear pounding on the door. Natalie stops what she's doing. She doesn't look away from her page. But she doesn't move either, as if pounding has frozen her solid. I think about not answering the door. There's no one I want to see. Not today. Other people could upset Natalie. The pounding doesn't stop. Natalie doesn't move except to dig her chin into her collarbone. Now it's quiet. No more knocking. The only sound is the wind blowing a door shut outside. Natalie seems to relax back into her work. But just as her pencil makes contact with the paper, knock, thud, knock. Natalie's chin hits her collarbone and digs hard again. If this keeps up, it'll make her crazy. I open the door. It's Piper, her hat in her hand, an odd attitude for her. Go away, I tell her. Gee, thanks, she says. No offense, but I'm trying to keep Natalie quiet today. The interview is tomorrow. That's fine. I wanted to come in, not go out, Piper says. No, you need to stay out, I explain. Me? I'm not going to upset Natalie. She likes me, Piper says. I'm sorry. I say, my hand on the door. Piper scoffs. Can I at least say happy birthday? She looks so earnest, so sincere, smiling her sweet smile. She's even prettier without her hat. How did you know it was her birthday? Teresa told me. I don't agree to let her in, but I must be easing my grip of the door because the next thing I know, Piper is standing inside her living room and the door is closed behind her. Happy birthday, Natalie. Piper squats down to where Natalie is resting on her elbows. Birthday, Natalie, Natalie repeats. I feel a stab of pain when I hear this. Natalie has come a long way. I can tell because she sounds like the old Natalie. She isn't parroting like this hardly at all anymore. Nice moons you got there. Piper stands up again. Okay, she says, that's all I wanted to do. I feel my eyebrows creep up my face. See, and you didn't trust me, Piper says as she brushes past me out the door. I watch her walk away. It feels like a vacuum has sucked the air out of our apartment. Piper is taking the air with her when she goes, and suddenly... I want her to stay. I shut the door quick before I call her back. Natalie is busy with her moons for another half hour, and I'm happily eating fold-over bread and butter sandwiches on the couch, my book in my lap, my legs across the arm of the chair. I look at Natalie. She's fine. I look down at the book again, and then I hear paper ripping. Natalie is tearing up the moons she made one by one, her chin jerking wildly down to her collarbone and up, down and up. Her eyes are beginning to storm over. Little torn pieces of paper float through the air, scattering everywhere. Uh-oh. 
I slap my book closed and jump up. I shouldn't have let her do the moons. It was too new, too unfamiliar. Natalie, I say, forget those stupid old moons. Let's have some lemon cake. Lemon cake, Natalie. For a second, I have her. We'll sit down. We'll eat. It will all be fine. But then the forces inside her seem to collide. I can almost see the battle in her eyes. All at once, the storm seems to win. Her eyes are leaving. Natalie, outside! I scream. I jump in front of her, rushing to unlock the door. She follows me. She's trying, trying to fight it. Outside, Nat seems calmer. She walks hunched over. She still seems wild, like the fight is raging inside her, but the walking is helping, giving her some place to go. Where do you want to go, Natalie? I ask. Nat says nothing. Okay, I tell her, we'll just walk. I shiver. I wish I'd remembered our jackets, but I'm afraid to stop her now. She looks too vulnerable, teetering on the edge, but she's following me. We'll walk until my mom gets home. Out on the parade grounds, we circle the cement once, twice. If she wants to walk in circles all afternoon, that's okay with me. Then abruptly, on the third rotation, Natalie breaks off and heads to the west stairs. I run to catch up to her and get in front, but she isn't following now. She's going her own way, and then suddenly Piper is there. I can't believe it. She's like, It's like she's a magnet in her head that draws her to trouble. What's the matter? She asks. Just out for a walk, I mutter. Piper gives me a funny look, then falls in line behind me. Natalie is walking fast. I skip in front of her and begin a slow U-turn. Natalie doesn't follow. I grab her hand, but the angry way she shakes me off scares me. I don't dare do it again. She's walking down the west stairs now. Natalie, look, rocks, let's count them. I say, jumping in front of her again, but she shoves past me. It's okay, let her go. Piper says from behind me, shut up, Piper. I spit back at her. She wants to say goodbye. Piper says, shut up, I said. Natalie walks on. Natalie, we don't need to go there anymore. We've already found a ball, I say. Natalie ignores me. Her head is down and she's walking fast as if she's late for something. It's late. He won't come. We're okay. The words repeat in my head as if the sound will make it so. The pulse is beating in my ears. I feel Piper's arm on my arm. Let her go, she says. My feet slow down like they are suddenly too heavy to lift. I let Natalie get a few steps ahead. I can't do this anymore. I can't make it right. I don't even know what right is. I watch Natalie. I don't let her out of my sight, but I'm climbing, but I'm higher on the hill, climbing a parallel course, and Piper is behind me. I breathe fast, short, shallow breaths. Nothing to worry about. See, see, he's not here, and then he is. The black greased hair, the short bulbed nose, the deep pockmarked skin, the uneven walk. I could take him. I know I could. Natalie, he says, pleasure and warmth in his voice. 105, 105, 105, she says. How you been, sweetie? He smiles at her. I stand up ready to crash down through the brush. How dare he? I feel a grip on my arm. Piper pulls me back down. I didn't think I'd get to see you again before you shipped out, 105 says. How does he know? I ask Piper. About her? Piper snorts. The cons know everything about us. Onion small, quick greasy hand takes hers. Natalie hates holding hands, I whisper. The tears sting my eyes. I stand up again, about to shout something, but nothing comes out. It's okay, Piper says. I stand still, quiet, shaking. Natalie is holding hands with a man convicted of some awful crimes. It's so strange, so awful, and so normal. Natalie doesn't look weird. She's my older sister, a 16-year-old girl holding hands with a man not much older than she is. This is terrible. This is good. Chapter 34, Happy Birthday. Same day, Monday, May 27th, 1935. We stay outside for the longest time, counting and cataloging rocks and shells. Piper and I are Nat's helpers, doing exactly what she tells us to do. I've never known Piper to take orders from anybody before, but she is now. We're a team, and Nat is in charge. When we do finally get home, it's almost dark, and my mother is there. She's in the kitchen frosting a cake. She's made a sign that says, Happy Birthday, Natalie and cut, curled, and painted long strips of newspaper to make confetti streamers, exactly like the ones my mom made last year. How's my birthday, girl? My mom says, asks Natalie. Natalie says nothing. She threads one newspaper streamer through her fingers. Piper, my mom says, maybe you'd like to come to Natalie's birthday party? Piper smiles her charm school smile. I'd love to, Mrs. Flanagan, she said. My heart dips low in my chest. I don't want to have Piper here for Natalie's party. We never invite anyone else. I'm surprised my mom asked her. 
I look at the cake my mom is frosting, the number 10 on the top, just like every other year. Seven o'clock tonight, right after supper, my mother says, shall I invite some of the other kids? Piper asks, oh no, let's keep it small, shall we? My mom says, her eyes avoid mine. The smile on her face is the one she uses when parents of an obnoxious piano student ask how he is doing. I go in my room and don't come out until supper, which I wolf down without saying a word and then return to my room. I plan on staying here until the last possible moment, which comes way too soon for me. Hey, Moose, we're having a party out here. Piper bangs on my bedroom door. She has a present wrapped in funny papers in one hand and a juice jar filled with lemonade in the other. Moose! My dad comes in where I'm sitting on the bed. Did someone give you a grumpy pills today? He puts my head in an arm lock and gives my scalp a good knock. Quit it, Dad, I say, but I can feel a smile creep on my face. Grumpy with a capital G! My father says. He winks at Piper, then whispers to me, What's the matter? Isn't one girlfriend good enough? I'm here as Natalie's friend. This has nothing to do with Moose. Piper announces as she pushes the sleeves of her sweater up past her elbows. Yes, well, I can see why. My father says, Go get yourself a hat and act like you're at a party, Moose. You're getting a bad reputation with the girls. Natalie looks up from the handful of streamers in her lap. Teresa, she says. My father laughs. Yes, you're right, honey. That's your brother's other girlfriend, isn't it? I go into the kitchen to get a hat. Natalie is running her hands over and over the orange streamers attached to the pitcher. Piper is right behind me. She looks at the cake with the big 10 on it and then back at Natalie through the doorway. I feel my face get hot. I'm suddenly so angry at my mother I can barely speak. Teresa, Teresa, Teresa. I hear Natalie say, why is she saying that? I ask my mom. Don't ask me. Shame on you, Moose. Go ask your sister. My mother says. Natalie looks up. Not quite at anybody, but up just the same. Teresa, here, Natalie says. Teresa. My mother's face lights up. Did you hear that, Moose? Did you? Now you move those overgrown feet of yours and invite Teresa over. I knock on the madam in store. Teresa answers, already in her pajamas. Of course Natalie wants me, silly. We're friends. She informs me when I tell her what Natalie said. Jimmy, Teresa hollers. She ducks into Jimmy's room and drags him out. Jimmy looks dazed like he's been living underwater. Mommy, she calls to Mrs. Madaman. Jimmy and I are going to the Flanagan's. Back in our kitchen, we start singing, but before we even get through birthday, Teresa puts her hands up like a policeman and yells, wait, we forgot Annie. We all look at her. My mother's cheek twitches a little, like she's not pleased about this. She opens her mouth to object, but too late, Teresa is already out the door. When Annie arrives, she smiles at us and we all begin singing again. This time we get all the way through. Hey, Natalie, did you know your birthday is four months and 10 days after Al Capone's? Annie says as my mother cuts the cake. January 17, Natalie says. 17, that's his birthday, all right. I made a card for him too, Teresa says. I cut out little circles to look like bullet holes and everything. How did he get that scar anyway, I ask. My father winks at me, girl trouble, he says. My mother starts to open Natalie's presents. I'm not sure why we bother wrapping them. Natalie doesn't understand why presents should be wrapped. If you give her a wrapped gift, she takes it and puts it on her shelf that way. Mrs. Flanagan, what are you doing? Teresa asks. My mother gets a little red. She flashes her pinched smile. Natalie doesn't really, I can almost see her searching for the right words, care to open her own gifts. Excuse me, Mrs. Flanagan, but that's my job. Teresa snatches the half-wrapped present out of my mother's hand and rips the rest of the wrapping off. Oh, my mother says. She and my dad exchange a big smile. My mom moves the presents over to where Teresa is sitting. The first gift is from me. It's a math workbook I got at school. From Piper, she gets a bag of buttons. Thank you, Piper. These will be for later. My mom winks at Piper, then slips the bag of buttons in her apron pocket. Teresa gives Nat my father's gift, a book about birds with an enormous index, and from my mother, a book bag with Natalie Flanagan, the Esther P. Marinoff School, embroidered on the front. My mom doesn't embroider. I don't think she even knows how. Convicts in the tailor shop, my dad whispers in my ear. The gifts are all unwrapped now, and Natalie is looking at them. She touches each with her fingertips and then sniffs every one. We talk for a while, and when it's time for everyone to leave, my father says, Moose, Walk your friends home, please. Or maybe I should say your harem, he whispers in my ear. Yours and Jimmy's, that is. Give it a rest, Dad, I say. My dad rumples my hair. His eyes are bright and hopeful. We all walk together. First, we drop off Jimmy and Teresa, then Annie. Good night, you two, Annie says to me and Piper. I don't like the way she says this. I pull up my shirt collar, which is pinching my neck. 
We walk up the steep road to Piper's house. It's beautiful out. The blue-black night all around. The black, black water. San Francisco like a bright box of lights. This is the most beautiful place I've ever been. Then I look at the cell house, sad and silent. The lights are dim. I don't hear anything except for deep inside the sound of one metal cup clanking the length of the bars and one lone voice calling for help. What's that? I asked, careful not to sound spooked. They do that now and then. Usually it's a bunch of them, but the way that way it's hard to tell who's doing it. What's the matter? I ask. Who knows? Piper says. When we get to her house, she stops. How old is she really? She asks. I don't say anything. Fifteen? She asks. Sixteen. My voice answers. My whole body flames hot and sweaty, then cold. Piper nods. That's what we figured, she says. I walk back down the hill, the word we buzzing inside my head like a fly in a small room. Chapter 35, The Truth. Same day, Monday, May 27th, 1935. When I get home, my mom is doing the dishes. Natalie is sitting in the living room, paging through a magazine. For a second, there's something so normal about this until I realize the pages are turning too fast and she's holding the magazine too close to her face. It's the breeze from the spinning pages she's after. My mom seems more relaxed. The party went well. The day is almost over. Natalie seems fine, as calm as she ever is. I try to walk away, shut the door of my room, but I can't. Something inside won't let me. You can't do this, I tell my mother. What? She, my mother looks up from the pot she's scouring. She isn't 10, I say, my voice hoarse. My mother winces and turns away. Yes, she is, she says in a tough voice. No, she's not, Mom. She's not, and everybody knows it. My mom continues to stare at the pot. Her face is quivering. Her hands are scrubbing. She is. She sputters. No, Mom. You know she's not. Eleven, my mom gulps. She sounds like a very little girl. I'm going to say she's eleven. It's her birthday today. She looks sixteen. She is sixteen. No, just no, my mother roars. People know, Mom. They know. They don't know, she cries, tears streaming down her face. You don't know. She won't have a chance at 16. No one will take her. No one cares about an adult that isn't right. It's only kids who have a chance. It's too late if she's 16. Don't you see? Yeah, but mom, you can't pretend. It's worse. People know. No one knows. They don't know and they don't care. Put her in an institution. Do you know how many times I've heard that? Lock her up with all the nuts. She has to be 10. It's the only chance she has. Don't you think they know at the Esther P. Marina? Don't you think Mr. Purdy can tell? Everybody can tell, Mom. No, they can't. She's tall for her age. You're tall, too. She's not going to be like everybody else, Mom. This is her only chance, and it's no chance at all if you're not honest. Don't say it. Don't you dare say anything. My mom's hands are pressed over her ears. My father rushes inside. He had been outside on the front balcony chewing his toothpicks. He must have heard us. He looks at my mom, then at me. What the heck is going on here? Natalie is 16, Dad. We can't pretend she's not anymore. She isn't 10. She just isn't. My dad bites his lip hard. Let's not do this now, Moose. Not with the interview tomorrow. We have to do it now. Mr. Purdy knows. Everybody knows. We can't try to fool them. It won't work. She won't get in. My father's eyes get big. He shakes his head, but so slowly, he seems to be saying no to what he's thinking, not to me. It's quiet in the kitchen. My mother is sitting on the step stool, her face buried in her hands. My father turns away. I can see by how he covers his head with his hand how ashamed he is of crying. Moose, he says, trying to wipe the tears away with his handkerchief. He takes a big, noisy breath. No, my mo mom cries. No. Natalie is in the living room, silently rocking. My dad presses his lips together and wipes at his eyes. He seems to get himself together and breathes a half breath. Half sigh. Moose is right, honey. Don't you dare, my mother cries. Yes, he says again. He puts his arm around my shoulders and walks me out to the living room where Natalie is sitting, rocking. Natalie, he asks softly, his voice breaking. How old are you? I am 16 at 231 today, Natalie says, her eyes focused on the table lamp. My father presses his lips so hard together they turn white. The tears are falling again so fast it looks as if he can't see. He puts his arm around me and pulls me to Natalie. He puts his other arm around her. I am, he wipes at his eyes with his shoulder so he doesn't have to let go of us. So very proud of my children. So 
very proud. A sob escapes his chest. What wonderful people you've grown to be.